on June 20, 1987, in the mountains of Ararat, Turkey officially recognized the discovery of Noah's Ark. Located on a mountainside about 15 miles south of the volcanic Mount Ararat, the remains of the massive ship were dedicated during a special ceremony. Guest of honor was Ron Wyatt due to his 10 years of research at the site. The story began in 1957 during the Cold War when aerial photos taken of eastern Turkey while searching for Soviet missile bases revealed a strange boat-shaped formation in the mountains about 6,300 feet above sea level. Life magazine reported on the story after an expedition from the United States went to the site in 1960. Blowing holes in the strange formation, the members of the team came away with the conclusion that there was nothing there of any archaeological interest. Ron Wyatt, like many others, read the story, but he was of the opinion that the site needed further exploration. There had been many claims of seeing Noah's Ark on the volcanic Mount Ararat, but Ron knew that it was a stratovolcano, and he believed that nothing would have been able to survive there. He noted the biblical account of the location of the ark. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Uratu, the biblical Ararat, was a large region in eastern Turkey. This location was certainly feasible. But the factor that captured his interest the most was the length given in the Life magazine story. 500 feet. Most people were looking for a 437-foot Noah's Ark based on the Hebrew cubit, but Ron again went to the Bible to learn more. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses was the author of the Genesis account of the flood. He would have known the cubit of the Egyptians. The Hebrew cubit didn't come into existence until there was a Hebrew nation after Moses' death. The Encyclopedia Britannica stated, The Egyptian cubit is generally recognized as having been the most ubiquitous or universal standard of linear measurement in the very ancient world. The royal cubit equals 20.62 inches. This would mean Noah's Ark was much longer than 437 feet. Seventeen years after the Life magazine article, Ron finally made the journey to Turkey. When he saw the boat-shaped object, he saw that it looked just like it did in 1960, and he knew he would need permission to excavate in order to learn anything about what was beneath the surface. So he returned home, and enlisted a number of friends to help him pray for an earthquake to reveal more. In late 1978, he learned of an earthquake in eastern Turkey and returned in August of 1979. When he arrived, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. The earthquake had dropped the soil around the object and a large crack extended the entire length. He could see what looked to him like the remains of decayed rib timbers along the now exposed sides. Also, he was able to measure the depth of the debris and measure the length. It was 515 feet, or exactly 300 royal Egyptian cubits. He was now convinced. He carefully combed the surface, looking for evidence that it was a shipwreck. He saw what he believed were petrified structures of an ancient ship whose deck had collapsed. He saw what looked like deck joists and deck support timbers. Of particular interest was the fact that the ship appeared to be impaled on a large outcropping of limestone. He concluded that this indicated that the ship had slid into the rock from another location. Before he made his first trip to Turkey, he had done an experiment in a nearby lake, building mountain configurations out of rocks and floating a boat model by them to see the reaction of the boat. He noted that a crescent shape 
caused the water to pull the boat into the crescent where the boat remained and gently floated. The present location did not fit with the results of that experiment, so Ron decided to examine the area above the boat shape. The site was in a moving mud flow, so he followed the mud flow up the mountainside. About a mile and a half up, he found a crescent shape of mountains. He saw that the mud flow began up here. When he arrived near the top of the ridge, he found an ancient stele, like an ancient billboard, which depicted the boat shape, the familiar mountain ridge, several birds, and eight faces within the boat shape. Clearly, this was a reference to the ship of Noah and its eight survivors. He noticed a taller mountain peak on the stele that was no longer visible from that location. He concluded that it was a small volcano that had erupted long after Noah's Ark had landed and that it had carried the ship down the mountainside about a mile where it was impaled on the limestone outcropping, then covered in lava. The lava then encased the ship like a time capsule. The volcano then collapsed after expending its lava and was no longer visible. He then theorized that as the lava began to decay, water seeped in and allowed the remains to be petrified or fossilized by the process called mineral replacement. Molecule by molecule would be washed away from the remains and replaced by molecules from the objects and substances above it. As he examined the area within the crescent shape, he found a large section, 120 by 40 feet, approximately, of what appeared to be fossilized wood in the ground. He believed this to be the bottom of the ship, the original landing site. His conclusion was that when the flood water subsided, the ark sank into the muddy earth. This held the ship upright. Then God sent the wind to dry the face of the earth, the portion of the ship that sank into the mud was now firmly embedded in the ground. Many years later, when the lava carried the ship down the mountain, the main body of the ship was ripped loose. Only this section remained in their original location. Around this area that Ron believed to be embedded petrified wood, he found specimens of rock which looked very unique to him. He took several samples, along with several specimens from the boat shape below. Back home, he sent them for analysis. The results showed organic carbon, which indicated that the samples were consistent with decayed and fossilized wood. They also contained metals, such as iron and aluminum. The analysis of the strange-looking rock Ron had found about a mile and a half above the site by the bottom of the ship was clearly the most exciting. His initial analysis had shown it to be metals and not rock. In 1984, Ron met and became friends with Colonel Jim Irwin, the former astronaut. Colonel Irwin was searching for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, but he was very gracious and was interested in seeing the boat-shaped site. Ron had brought a metal detector to the site to see if there was a pattern of metal readings. In the presence of Colonel Irwin and others on his team, Ron employed the detectors. He found distinct metal lines down the entire length of the object, while no metal readings were obtained just outside of it. Ron asked Colonel Irwin, who had impressive scientific community connections, if he could have the strange specimen tested. Colonel Irwin sent the specimen to Los Alamos National Labs, where geophysicist John Baumgartner performed the analysis. The results of that analysis captured Dr. Baumgartner's interest. The specimen contained manganese, 
also titanium and aluminum, among others, and these were not in the form found in nature. Due to the sophistication of the metals, he questioned whether a missile had crashed on the mountainside and Ron had found the remains. The exciting evidences of the metal lines and the analysis of the specimens brought two new researchers into the work. Dr. Baumgartner and David Fassel, a marine salvage expert who knew all about ships and their construction. They both joined the team. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get a close-up of that. Kind of, um... You want my hand in there for... Yeah, just to point at those little okay. flakes of iron that are coming out, like right there. There and there. Huh. That's a strong reading. Hmm. Well, I'd say that that uh, those frames right there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> keep walking. Do you want Do you want a measuring tape to measure these things? How far apart they are? Dr. Baumgartner and Ron scanned the entire site with three different types of metal detectors. Placing rocks at each metal reading, they then attached tapes to show the lines. This exciting evidence also attracted the interest of ABC's 2020. The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassel, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape, outlined by the ribbons, was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon attracted higher academic interest. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical arc. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. Gear like this located the black box cockpit recorder on the floor of the frozen Potomac River after the Air Florida crash. It was here, several miles short of the boat-shaped site, that a waiting game began for Finner and the others. The party needed a final go-ahead from the Turkish government to complete their probe of Doomsday Mountain. The restrictions of martial law left the American explorers isolated from the outside world. Not even a telephone. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to hang in like smell on a skunk till there's nothing left to get this done. Hang in like the smell on a skunk. The Turkish government stopped the, the exploration. What now? Since we were there, Barbara, things have cooled down, and they've sent their own team of scientists in to take a look at this site. It's a very fascinating location.
While Turkish scientists and archaeologists did their own research, Ron and his associates continued their work. The next step was subsurface interface radar. There's a longitudinal bulkhead. You ought to see them popping out, Ron. Yeah, there they are. There's another one. There's the key line right there. Yeah. Oh, Ron, the lines are there! Ha <laughs> ha! The lines are there! Okay, we're gonna walk over. Yeah. Take a look. Leave it, leave it running so everybody knows that we're not cheating here, right? <laughs> you got it, Cole. Okay, now, this is the west, the west bulkhead. Okay, can you look through there and... All right. This is the west bulkhead. All right. That was over there. And he walked easterly. Here we start getting the longitudinal bulkheads. Here, 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 here. here. Okay. You see there how it shows up? All right. The initial scans were very impressive, showing internal structure consistent with bulkheads and rooms. But to be sure they were interpreting the data correctly, Ron took the scan printouts to geophysical survey systems the developer and manufacturer of the radar. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random nat natural type interface. There was no longer any doubt that this was the remains of something man-made. In late 1986, the Turks announced their decision. The ceremony was set for June 1987. During that ceremony, the governor asked Ron to demonstrate the radar on site for the journalists and military officials. When Ron showed them a readout that he said looked like an intact timber, the governor then instructed a soldier to dig right there. What emerged was this petrified section of fossilized, hand-wrought timber. Sectioning showed it to be laminated wood, five layers of timber glued together with pitch, clearly visible oozing from the end. This fossilized specimen shows that rivets were used in its construction. Their analysis showed that they contained iron, titanium, and aluminum, among other things very sophisticated alloys that would be resistant to water. Specimens falling out from the lower end of the ship identified as slag by an expert in metallurgy syndicated to Ron that Noah filled the hull with slag material from his metal production of the fittings used to build the ark. More complete radar scans revealed a ship, although damaged and collapsed in places, a very intelligent modern design with a ramp system at the door which led to each level. In 1990, Ron performed what he called a mini-excavation, where he took shovels and bent the blades into a giant razor. He and his associates then shaved off a very thin layer from one section, smoothing it to show the color difference between the structure members and the matrix. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. For as in the days before the flood, 
they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be.